Hello juniors, what we're going to talk about in this video is how to build a galvanic cell. Essentially, a galvanic cell is the way that we're going to harness the energy that's output by an oxidation reduction reaction. A redox reaction can produce a cell potential difference, and in order for us to harness that potential and do something useful with it, we have to engineer a system that allows us to do that, that system is going to be called a galvanic cell. A galvanic cell is sort of a cheap version, a laboratory version of a battery. So batteries are galvanic cells, but in a way not all galvanic cells are batteries because batteries are more specially engineered. So let's take a look at how to build a galvanic cell. First, we're going to have some terminology, and we've seen some of these terms before. We're going to talk about a reducing agent. Remember the terminology. If you're a reducing agent, then you yourself have been oxidized. We'll have an oxidizing agent, which means that'll be something that's going to take electrons from another species, so it itself gets reduced. We'll have half reactions. We'll have an anode. That's going to be the site, the part of the experiment where the oxidation occurs. A cathode. That'll be the site where the reduction occurs. And then the cell potential, which will tell us how much work or how much voltage ultimately this galvanic cell is going to be able to do. So let's take a look and see what a basic skeleton of a galvanic cell looks like. Here's what a galvanic cell sort of looks like. As you can see, we've got two beakers, and those squiggly blue lines represent the fact that there are going to be some solutions in these beakers. And then we have some other components. We have, in each beaker, we have an electrode. We'll talk about what the electrodes will be made out of in a later class, but for now the only important thing that we have about the electrode is that they are some kind of conductive material, usually going to be some kind of a metal, and that the metal doesn't interfere with the electrochemistry we want to do, so we want to use some sort of robust inert metal. Platinum often makes a really good choice. Then we have those two electrodes being connected by a copper wire. That's where the current is going to flow. And if we wanted to, we could splice into that wire and connect our light bulb or some other electrical device that we're trying to power with our galvanic cell. Then this rectangular um, series of lines that are connecting the two, the two beakers is something called a salt bridge. I'll get to what the salt bridge does a little bit later on, but it essentially compensates for the fact that electrons are going to be moving from one beaker to the other, and we're going to generate a separation of charge. The salt bridge will help keep electrical neutrality. We'll see that in a little bit. So, if we're going to have a galvanic cell, then we need the fuel for a galvanic cell. In electrochemistry, in redox chemistry, the fuel of a galvanic cell is the oxidation reduction or redox reaction. Here's the reaction that we're going to use as the fuel for our cell. We're going to take H plus and potassium permanganate or permanganate and iron 2, and we're going to generate manganese 2, iron 3, and some water. So hopefully, if you spend a little bit of time looking at the oxidation states of the compounds and the species in that reaction, you can figure out what's being oxidized and what's being reduced. We'll come to that in a little bit. Now I'm going to start to label the parts of my galvanic cell. On the right-hand side, we're just going to arbitrarily call the right-hand side. That's going to be the cathode compartment. That's where I'm going to put the uh, reduction reaction um, portion of the galvanic cell. So then on the left-hand side will be my anode. That'll be where the oxidation's going to occur. All right. So then that must mean that in the anode where oxidation is occurring, that is where my reducing agent is going to be located. Remember, if you're getting oxidized, you yourself are a reducing agent. And then in the anode compartment, or excuse me, the cathode compartment where reduction is occurring, that's where my oxidizing agent will be located. So, back to our overall reaction. So if you spend a couple of seconds to figure out what's being reduced and oxidized, you'll see that we have Fe plus 2 going to form Fe plus 3, that's being oxidized, and in my permanganate I have manganese 7 that's going down to manganese 2, 
that is what's going to be reduced. So, my cathode compartment contains my oxidizing agent, so the half reaction that's going on in that part of the galvanic cell would be that reduction half reaction, the permanganate being reduced to Mn plus 2, and to make sure that the oxygens and hydrogens balance, I need some H plus on the left and some waters on the right. Over in the anode compartment, where my reducing agent is located, well, that's where the oxidation occurs. And specifically, I have iron 2 going to form iron 3. Now, if you notice, in the oxidizing, um, or in the cathode reaction, I have five electrons being transferred. So I'm going to have to take my oxidation reaction and multiply it by five to make sure the moles of electrons between the oxidation and the reduction end up balancing out. All right, so now I need to put in my chemical ingredients into my galvanic cell. So the right-hand side is the cathode. That's where the oxidizing agent is going to be located, and that in this case is the permanganate, MnO4. So I'm going to have a solution of MnO4 on that right-hand side. If you remember some of your colors in chemistry, you might know that permanganate tends to produce a very vivid, deep purple color. Now that's not the only thing I need in the cathode compartment. As you can see in the half reaction for the reduction, I need to acidify that solution. So I'll indicate that by putting some H plus in that beaker as well. Now over to the anode, I need to quite simply oxidize Fe plus 2. So then I need to have a solution of iron plus 2 over there in the anode compartment. All right, so I have all the chemical ingredients in place. So what's going to happen is in the anode compartment, we're going to liberate electrons. As Fe plus 2 goes to Fe plus 3, that compartment is going to liberate electrons. Those electrons are going to travel up this gray electrode on the left-hand side, go through the copper wire over to the electrode on the other side in the cathode. So I can indicate a direction of electron flow through that external copper wire. The electrons in this case are going to flow left to right. They always flow anode to cathode. Now as a result of the electrons going from the anode to the cathode, as you can imagine, that's going to build up negative charge over here in the cathode compartment and leave behind positive charge over here in the anode compartment. That's where the salt bridge comes in. The salt bridge is going to maintain electrical neutrality because it is exactly what it sounds like. It's a bridge that consists of salt, positive and negative ions. So to make sure we don't build up a separation of charge, we're literally going to transport salt ions out of the salt bridge into the two solutions. Specifically, the negative part of the salt, let's say it's potassium nitrate. So the negative ion, the nitrate, is going to flow out of the salt bridge over towards the anode compartment. Meanwhile, the positive portion, the potassium, the K+, will flow over towards the cathode compartment to maintain electrical neutrality over there. Okay, we're almost done. I've got all the chemical ingredients. I've got all the infrastructure of my galvanic cell for my electrodes, my wire, and my salt bridge, and uh, my solutions. Now I need to tell you how much potential, how much voltage, this galvanic cell will generate. Well, that we're going to need to look up some cell potentials in a chart. And we'll go over the details of how we do this in class. But on the right-hand side of my cathode, this oxidation reaction occurs with a cell potential of 1.5 volts. That half reaction will generate 1.51 volts. Meanwhile, the oxidation reaction, the oxidation of iron 2 to iron 3, that will produce a cell potential of negative 0.77 volts. So to find the overall cell potential of the whole reaction, I combined 1.51 volts with negative 0.77 volts to get an overall cell potential of 0.74 volts. Now if you remember what the voltage of, say, a AA battery is, it's about 1.5 volts. So the galvanic cell that I've made here with its measly 0.74 volts is kind of a pretty crummy battery. But 
we're not looking to produce the, the, most, uh, the, the most voltage here. We're just trying to show you the elements, the key ideas of building a galvanic cell. So once again, we have our anode and our cathode compartments with the appropriate chemical species shown in both. We have our electrodes, and we'll talk in more detail later on about what the electrodes should be made out of. We have our salt bridge, which transports ions, uh, the negative ion into the anode, the positive ion into the cathode, to maintain electrical neutrality as the electrons flow from the anode to the cathode. We'll take a look at additional uh, examples of galvanic cell building in class later on. That's all for now.